Hello, David. Sorry, I'm muted. Hey, Richard, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. You put in a waiting room, or how did the waiting? I, I was in the waiting room for just a moment. Yeah. Okay. We'll see if other people end up in there. I, I mean, I, as far as I know, we don't have one, but never know. Yeah. Well, and I think, as I mentioned, you can enable the waiting room. Am I considered a host? All right, let me set you up. Participants, I'll, I'm going to make you a, a co-host, if you don't mind. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. <clears throat> make co-host. Okay. And then, um, I guess we wanted to look at things like sharing, this, putting the uh, focus on the screen and things like that, if you have a, you know, Right. Whatever you'd like to do. Right. So if you <clears throat> do, let's see, let me look at the, okay, so the waiting room is enabled. And then once we, once you, we let in who we want to let in at the beginning, and once we're ready to say, okay, let's start letting the crowds in, you can just, just say, you can admit all, and then you can just disable the waiting room so you don't have to keep so where, where is that? Um, That's under security. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I guess right I now. need to get my presentation ready too. Yep. Okay. Let's see. All right, let's see how that works out. I'll let and, you get started for a minute. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, you can, and I'm going to pause the recording in, yep. until we're ready to start. So just remember to start it up again. Right, you remind me and I'll remember. <laughs> what time should we leave before I start the opening remark? I mean, you I would say you know, within 30 seconds of uh, eight o'clock. After eight o'clock. You know, there's no reason, nobody really wants to hear you anyway. So you might as well just start right away. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and admit all. So let me let me see if I can do that. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, and I don't know where to do that. It, not... So go to the participants tab, or open up participants okay. down in the lower thing. Yeah. Okay. Admit all. Got it. Waiting room. Admit all. Admit all. Check. All right. And now I can speak to people. Uh. Hello, welcome to our meeting. Um, I see most of you are uh, muted, that's great. Please also try to put your full name on, this, on your screen name because it's nice when we chat that we can uh, identify who, who we're speaking to. And uh, uh, Hammer, uh, you're, uh, you, you, I don't know, maybe that's your name, I don't want to insult you, but it'd be, more, it'd be fun to have a, a more normal name. Uh, but you know, I'm not gonna push it. Uh, so uh, great, we're filling up. Thanks for joining us. We'll be starting about three minutes. Richard, I, I went ahead and admitted all the rest of the waiting room, and I'm going to disable the waiting room so right, that they can just come that. right in. Security. All right. And disabled. Great. Okay. Super. All right. Yep. I, hey. I don't have my fingers, so I am. So. Hey, right. Elliot, are you officially Rick Kramer? Hang on. I'm changing it. There's reasons I'm changing it. I'm going to be Andy Fandel, okay? Oh, uh, then you better have a lot to say. I don't have enough. I'm not good looking enough. Don't leave yourself that far open. That's okay. That's all right. I got big shoulders. Hi, everyone. Uh, hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. 
Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. It's nice to see we have some fellow Texans in the crowd and, and a shout out to uh, David Kalmeyer. Almost don't recognize him with his beard. You're muted, Dave. I was wondering if you'd recognize me, Dave. Good to well, see you. I, I saw some guy drinking beer, uh, drinking a beer, and I go, he came equipped for this presentation, and then I realized who it was. So definitely well, that's a, the Texan way, isn't it? That's right. Long necks and, and yeah. beer. Yeah, I'm actually not in Texas anymore, but. I, that's okay. We'll claim you. I know. Well, I, I put it so you'd remember me. No, I definitely, definitely know you. There's a lot of familiar faces here. I hope you're in the right place. <laughs> Some of our sessions are in a week or two, but what the heck? This should be great no matter what. Richard, why are you orange? I, I, it's the wrong color bulb, apparently. I, I must have a very soft white bulb and, and the background is still a blue sky. So somehow, we'll see if I change color over the course of the night. <laughs> Bad white like balance. Catching some of the sunset. Yeah, it's a concept called white balance. We'll be covering that in uh, one of the topics either tonight or in a future topic. I always like to be an example. Also, it's not a good idea to use a light room, uh, a dark room bulb to illuminate you. That'll cast the glance. Okay. You can talk about the color patches on the rover and how they figure out how the, uh, the color would look on Mars. All right, well, so it's, it's, it's 8 o'clock. I'm going to mute everybody and invite uh, David Greenfield to welcome us tonight. Okay, uh, give me one moment to make you the focus. Uh, if I remember how. Uh, David, okay, spotlight for everyone. All right. David, you're on. Uh, you're muted. Okay, now I'm not. Okay, well, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to everyone to the uh, first Federation of Jewish Men's Club Photography webinar. So I'm David Greenfield, one of the co-chairs of the uh, new photography affinity group, and I'll be uh, moderating this evening. Just a word, a personal word, photography has been part of my life for as long as I can remember. Uh, as a matter of fact, when specifically asked how long, um, I simply say, uh, I believe it's part of my DNA. Um, so like some of you or many of you, I cut my photographic teeth using black and white film with a camera that had no automatic controls whatsoever. However, uh, a decade or so ago, when I crossed the digital divide, I quickly became enamored with digital photography and in fact, intoxicated by how easily it was to share the work, which previously had been shared sort of brick and mortar on the wall and framed, but share it with the entire world. And uh, now I do that through my website and a, a photographic blog uh, that I write. But uh, that's enough about me for now. Uh, what's the story you may be asking about the photography group? Uh, well, to answer, I'm just gonna start with a little scenario here. Consider the following interchange between two friends who are looking at a stunning photo. So the first guy reacts and says, wow, that, what's the best camera for capturing a dramatic photo like that? To which his friend responds, it's the camera that you have with you. Now, we may on occasion leave home without an American Express card, but certainly not without our phone. And if you have a phone, you actually have a compact camera with very impressive features, which also happens to be able to make phone calls. So in essence, we always have a camera with us. And if you weren't before, you can quickly become a photographer. But the camera is merely a tool so whether you capture your images with a smartphone, a point and shoot, a Kodak Brownie, 
um, a, a mirrorless or a top of the line hefty DSLR. The principles of creating impressive images um, are always the same. It's composition, it's perspective, the light, exposure, just to name a few. So wherever you are on the curve, uh, be it novice or seasoned professional, it's the eye of the beholder that matters. Henri Cartier-Bresson, the master of the decisive image, believed great photos are made when the photographer's head, heart, and eyes are aligned on the same axis. And FJMC members can get there too. Some of us who are already savvy may want to add to their skill set. They may, may want to share their work, which we will be encouraging, uh, or chat with other like-minded enthusiasts, or perhaps teach others. And we encourage those to volunteer for that. That was so. That was the incentive for starting the group. Now, for this ignore ignore uh, inaugural meeting, we chose a topic with general appeal: sports photography. With opportunities for documenting professional events, amateur, college, high school, or our kids or grandkids weekend games, there's something for everyone. Now we're fortunate to have, fortunate to have two homegrown speakers this evening, David Duchin from Texas and Andy Fandel from uh, Sharon Mass. So before I introduce them formally, uh, there are a few housekeeping rules. Uh, Richard has already muted everybody. Please stay that way and submit your questions through the chat, which I will monitor. We will aim to end around nine o'clock and then we'll linger uh, longer if need be for some further discussion uh, in a Q&A. And we encourage uh, participation in that. So um, David Duchin is a semi-pro photographer in, based in Dallas and a member of the Professional Photographers Association. He's the sole proprietor of DSPN Photos, an event photography company, which he began using his Nikon D70. He started the business shooting sporting events and theater performances and, evolved, and has evolved the business to now focus on private simcha and corporate events. He's active in the Meds Club at Congregation Beth Torah in Richardson, Texas. Andy um, is a photography enthusiast right here in Sharon, Mass, where I'm based in Massachusetts. He enjoys taking sports photos for his kids' high school and club teams and sharing them with the athletes and parents. His other photography passion is landscape photography. Uh, Andy currently serves as one of the directors for Temple Israel Brotherhood in Sharon. And now I will be happy to turn the program over to David and Andy. Take it away, guys. Thank you very much, David. And let me just first start off that it's a pleasure to, to meet you guys and come together uh, to form this affinity group. And it's amazing uh, how many people across the country uh, share our interest in photography. So uh, very happy to, uh, to form this group and look forward to future meetings where we talk on various topics. Um, and so I, I guess I'll start the presentation and I wanted to let, let everybody know as part of the housekeeping is uh, we want this to try and be as interactive as possible. And so even though I have a slideshow deck uh, that I'll be going through, it, as questions arise, please type them in the chat uh, to everyone. And we have uh, Richard uh, and David that will be monitoring the chat. And they'll actually interrupt Andy or I uh, during our presentation and raise the questions and, and talk about them. And then if we don't get to them during the presentation, uh, we'll cover those questions uh, after the presentation. And we'll, we hope to leave ourselves enough time prior to the uh, upcoming hour, top of the hour, uh, to talk more about uh, any questions and talk about uh, future sessions. So without further ado, let me share my screen and start with uh, sports action photography, how to capture these magic moments. Um, I will tell you, uh, 
somebody noticed that there's a lot of Duchens on this call. My two sons uh, and daughter are on the call. And uh, although my daughter did not play hockey, uh, my two boys did, and they played a wide variety of sports. So they'll be uh, featured in many of these shots. Um, as, as David mentioned, I did start a business doing event photography. Um, and so I, I have shot uh, from the kids sports on up through junior high, high school, college, uh, some semi-pro and some professional sports. So uh, they're not all of my kids' uh, pictures, but I, I do enjoy seeing those and taking those the best, the most. So as David alluded to, the basics of photography are, are always at play. And especially in, in sports, it's the exposure of the, of the image. You know, what's the proper mix of the shutter speed, the aperture, the, the ISO, uh, and what lighting options are there. And for those that uh, may be new to photography, um, the shutter speed, of course, is the, the length of time that the shutter stays open. The aperture is, is how large the uh, hole or opening is that exposes the, the sensor or film behind the lens. And the ISO is the uh, light sensitivity of the film or the sensor. Uh, so those are kind of some of the basics. Uh, as far as the focus, uh, there's lots of different cameras out there that offer lots of different options. And we can talk further about those, but uh, as always, if, if your shot's not in focus, uh, it's probably not going to be a keeper. Um, composition and style are also important. Uh, what's your ideal photo look like in your mind? Plan ahead, and then that will help you determine where you want to be to take that photo. Um, and then the other thing is, what's the purpose? Why are you taking these photos? Is are you telling a story? Is it for journalism? Is it, you know, for the uh, a newspaper or magazine? Is it for the team's uh, end of year slideshow? And and so trying to decide what and who you're trying to uh, capture in your images is is important. You know, is it are you going out and just focusing on your child uh, during the game, or are you wanting to get pictures of of the entire team and post it up for uh, publication for other parents to download or buy. Uh, so that's that's kind of how I got started. I was uh, I borrowed a friend's uh, digital SLR and had the good fortune of catching my youngest son at a soccer game, and so uh, I very quickly fell in love with the concept of of sports action photography. And the things that got me interested were, well, how can I make these images look like they belong in Sports Illustrated? And so I did a lot of research. You read it, read through, skim through the magazines. But uh, fortunately, there was a uh, online forum that a lot of professional sports photographers were on. And so uh, you, I was able to pick up some tips from that. One of the important tips that I, I want to share with you is to shoot from a very low position. And it helps make the athlete or even a child look very big. And as you can tell in this image, um, and then to, to get that further Sports Illustrated look, you want to zoom in as much as you can and cry, crop tight and focus on your player. And the long focal length uh, helps in, in causing an effect called a, sh a, a shallow depth of field, where the background's in a softer focus. And so it brings to the forefront the actual player and, and puts focus on him. Um, the fast shutter speed will freeze the action. Uh, uh, a wide aperture uh, will help also in creating a shallow depth of field. And um, the aperture is also known as the f-stop. So uh, uh, to have the uh, aperture open and let in as much light as possible, 
that will be a low f stop, like a f 2.8. And if you have a smaller diameter aperture, that would be like an f uh, 16, which has a, a smaller diameter, so it lets in less light, but it also creates more depth of field. Um, the other kind of rule of thumb I follow is in all my sports photos that I think are quote winning sports photos, I, I want to see the ball or the puck or the frisbee or what, whatever it is, I want to see it in the picture because it helps convey the action. And if you have an image that is more about a story of emotion of the team just winning and you know jumping on top of the the pile of players that's a you know that's a different sports image and certainly those are great and and I've taken some and I'll show some but when I think of a sports action shot I think of I want to be sure to include all these items and be sure to include the ball um, David, can I just, uh, <clears throat> there's an interesting question that popped up in the chat. Please. If you are choosing to uh, do your sports photography w using an iPhone. Um, how do you uh, know what kind of f-stop you're, uh, you're using or any of the other parameters? Sure. So uh, camera phones are much like the, the SLRs and mirrorless uh, and point and shoot cameras that are on the market. Each of them are a little bit different. So I, I am not an iPhone user. I'm an Android user. And uh, the Android that I have actually has a, a pro mode where you can set the aperture or set the shutter speed. But um, and I'm not sure if those are features are available on the iPhone. But but I will address my suggestions for shooting with an iPhone a little bit later. So let me let me save that the rest of that answer later. Um, so so this next slide shows a player uh, probably getting tagged out as he steals uh, second base, and and the importance of this photo is you have to know where you can anticipate the action because in a lot of sports the action goes very fast. And especially if you're not just focused on your one child, uh, where it's easy to follow your child around the field and you're only taking your child and you catch the time when he's kicking the ball or catching the ball, great. But if you're out there shooting for the entire team or shooting for uh, other purposes, you want to be able to, to know the uh, where the action is. And so in cases like this, you can kind of pre-focus where the second base is so that when it's time that that runner steals or there's a play, a double play, your camera is already kind of focused at that. So when you press down on the shutter, it doesn't have to hunt to find where's the focus point. It's kind of already preset for you. Um, so in baseball and softball, knowing the action, as I mentioned, the second base uh, when there's a runner on first, but also just at the plate, uh, you know the batter is always going to be swinging at the ball. And so this uh, uh, shot, uh, it happens to be my youngest son, Jeremy, uh, during a USY uh, versus men's club game that we had at, uh, many years back. And so uh, I didn't even have my best lens with me. And, and I can, I know that by looking back at this image, uh, because the, the kids sitting on the bench and the people watching in the stands behind are almost in focus. They're, they're not as blurry as I would have made them if I had my big uh, F 2.8 lens, uh, a professional lens. So uh, this was shot with a 6.3 uh, aperture and about a 500th of a second is uh, I believe what the image had shown, but it was enough to pretty much freeze the action except for the ball. You can see a little movement of the ball uh, with that. Um, in hockey, uh, my, my, both my boys played hockey and uh, this is not a picture of my boy. It's a, a friend of his at the net uh, about to put the puck in, at least we hope so. But one of the things with hockey is you always want to keep your finger on the shutter 
because you never know what's going to happen next. And so in this case, uh, Mr. Greenberg got plowed by a, a, the defenseman. Uh, and I think they did successfully keep the puck out of the net. Um, in hockey, another place where you can always expect action is the face-offs. And the thing that's nice about the face-offs is you can, uh, the action's kind of frozen. So it's easy to focus, it's easy to compose your image. And then it's just a matter of timing of, of pressing down the shutter and, and getting the puck as it drops or hits the ice or the players are, are fighting with their sticks to, uh, to get that. In soccer, uh, a corner kick is sure to bring the action to the goalie. So uh, this was taken from a corner kick um, and the player was trying to drive past the goalie, the goalie reaches out. And this shot, um, I shot at a uh, state uh, semifinal game of our son's high school. And my son didn't play on the on the soccer team. I was out there shooting to post and sell to the, the parents. And then I also uh, had started uh, providing images to our local Dallas Morning News uh, newspaper had not the, the paid for publication, but they had a, uh, a new publication that they came out with called the neighbor section, which each neighborhood uh, had their own weekly paper, and they had various articles of interest and it included sports images. So I, I became friends with the editor of that and uh, had several of my images on the front page of the neighbor section. And they even ran a photo contest, and this happened to win uh, one of the photo contests. But uh, this was shot with a rental lens, a 300 millimeter on my uh, Nikon D70S, which was my second digital SLR. Um, so it had an effective focal length of 450 millimeters. So a long reach. This is the kind of lens that you see the NFL pro photographers using uh, out on the fields. And so this had a 2.8 aperture and uh, a, uh, it was very dark in the stadium. And back in the day in 2006, the camera sophistication uh, the sensors were not as well developed as they are now. So I really had to be careful about how, what my ISO setting was or the light sensitivity setting. Typically, uh, when you're shooting outdoors, let's say, you'd have your ISO set to 200 or 400, and that would be plenty of light to, to let in uh, action and, and have a very high shutter speed. But at night with uh, low stadium lights, I was shooting at about uh, 2000 ISO. And, and I didn't want to go any higher just because you end up with too much grain or digital noise. Um, basketball tip-offs are a very predictable time that you can catch the action. And again, make use of that kind of pre-focus on the player and then be ready for, for the tip off and start shooting away. Hey, David, there's a question. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Andy. Oh, go, ahead. Or, go ahead and read the question and I can answer if you want. Okay. So there's a question here from uh, Bob Watts. He says, while generally having a shallow depth of field is preferable, if you're shooting fast action in which the players quickly move closer and further away, uh, you, doesn't that make focusing more challenging? Uh, well, there's two parts to that. One is that it depends on your camera. Um, the, for example, the camera that I use is an X-T3, and it has a great autofocus feature in it so that I can, um, uh, with continuous focus. So when you, even if I have a shallow depth of field, the tracking on the camera itself with the lens can can move the move along with the player itself and be able to keep it in focus. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult if you actually are, are pre-focusing in one location and, and shooting. Right, and, and, and uh, I, I take advantage also, I shoot with a Nikon and they have two different focus modes, a single shot focus mode AFS, and they have a continuous focus mode AFC. 
And even within the AFC, they have various settings for what happens when a player runs in front of the guy with the ball, you know, does it, it, it's got settings to, to kind of ignore it, or if it's there for a long time, then grab the focus and follow that guy. So there, there is a lot that you have to learn how to set the camera up properly to do it, the, the focus. Track. If I can unmute for a second to ask a follow-up question. So you lock the folk, you can lock the focus on a player, right? So keep, keep it from, from changing focus to other, other players. Yes. He, yes. I, I actually used a, a technique where, uh, and, and the cameras vary, but many of the cameras have several focus points on the grid or on the screen. And many of the cameras will light up the focal point that's in focus that it believes is, is in focus. I, I would tend to set one single focus point and have it at the top center of the of my frame and then instead of typically when you press down on the shutter it first focuses it locks and then as you continue to press down it it releases the shutter and captures the image there are settings in the camera that will prevent the camera from actually taking the photo unless the the camera believes it's in focus and i turn that feature off because I don't want to be a half second of it thinking it's not in focus and then I lose the action. So I set up my camera where it'll release whether it's in focus or not. And that just means that post-processing, I have to go through a lot of images and say, nah, not a keeper, not a keeper, out of focus. But the other thing I do, hold on one second while I cough, excuse me. The other thing that I do is there is a uh, optional button on the back of the camera that can be programmed to be your focus button. So instead of relying on the shutter being halfway pressed down to do your focus, I rely on my thumb pressing that third button or second button to do the focus. And it's only focusing when my thumb is pressed. So I'm following the action pressing and when I see it's locked and I'm good, I'll let go of my thumb and release the shutter a lot, or I may be pushing the focus and pressing the shutter at the same time. But it, it, the, the, that's the long answer to your question, Bob. The, the depth of field to me is more about the personality of the image and, and, what it, and the style of it. And whether you shoot with a, a wide open f-stop, you may get a slightly out of focus image that would be um, not usable if it were a shallow depth of field, but is usable with your higher uh, f-stop. But to me, I'd rather have that good shot of the player, in, or I call it a good shot. The, the shot I'm looking for, my style, which is focus on the player, you know, like on this image, number 47 is kind of in soft focus. Um, so, you know, it, it, it really is up to your style and what you're looking for. And so, uh, you know, getting back to the high school football game uh, to catch the action, if you're fo fortunate enough to be able to shoot from the sideline at a junior high game or high school, uh, you know, you want to be about five to 10 yards ahead of the line of scrimmage, let the play come to you, hope that the quarterback's rolling out to your side of the field, hope that the running backs come into your side of the field and then you catch catch these shots uh in tennis um and again my son my youngest son jeremy played uh high school tennis uh so uh tennis is an easy game to shoot because you only have one or two players on that side of the court that you're shooting on and here you can even see the uh player uh with the tennis racket his doubles partner he wasn't part of my shot that I was trying to get. I zoomed in on my son and it's easy to, you know, it takes some timing and practice, but it's easy to get the ball in play on these kind of shots. And which brings up the second point is look at the shot where it doesn't have the ball. This is the follow through shot. And to me, nothing personal, Jeremy, but it just looks awkward. You know, it, it, 
it looks like he's stumbling upon himself and you know what's the purpose of this photo kind of thing so to me this is the shot that would be thrown away uh, if you're shooting on the sideline of a football game and fortunate enough to have an opportunity to turn around and catch the cheerleaders cheering you know you can always get good shots of, of that so when i was shooting uh, high school games, I made sure I got not only the football players, but the cheerleaders, the uh, the uh, pace setters, uh, marching group that uh, danced and twirled uh, during the halftime performance. So I'd post and sell those photos as well. Uh, and then just a warning, whenever you're on the field and, and being at a, a football game, I'm not a very big guy and these high school football players can be big guys. So you always, two things. One, you don't wanna ever turn your back to the play when there's action on the field, because sure enough, that's when the player will run you down and you'll end up uh, in, in the next uh, embarrassing home video kind of thing. But the other thing is um, when you're setting up and shooting, you wanna be aware of what's behind you because there are times when you're shooting and the action's coming right at you and you do need to take, you know, five or six steps back or to the right or left. So be aware of your surroundings when, when you are at any game, uh, not just the big player game, but even, even your kids sport, you know, a, a soccer game of middle schoolers, you could get, uh, you, you may need to get out of the way quickly. David, before you, before you move on to the next one on the shot of the cheerleaders, I think it raises a, an interesting question here because you really captured the moment there. But uh, could you say something about using the burst mode in your camera versus, you know, really anticipating that one instance where you get the award, the award winning shot? Sure. And, and that is a great point. I, I neglected to mention that my camera I do set to burst mode. And it, the Nikon has two different speeds for burst mode. And depending on the event, I might turn it on high burst mode or, or just the regular burst mode. But almost all of my sporting event shots, I'm shooting in burst mode. And, and, it, and there's a, a, a saying that goes uh, spray and pray. So you spray a lot of shots and you pray a couple of them come out in focus and you catch the action just the way you want. So back to that cheerleading shot. I'm sure I, I, I'm sure I took uh, at least six or eight frames of them starting the jump and all the way through at the peak and then landing. So I, I know I took a bunch and, and it's important. Um, and, and it raises the other point, which is, you know, the timing of, of catching the ball at the end of the bat or in the frame, you know, so the first one is at the end of the bat or the middle one coming up to the bat or coming off the bat, it takes timing. And in order to get the timing down, you, you got to practice. And so these shots here are at a practice game. You know, it, it's just, you know, go out, whether it's your kids practice sport or, or some other practice, but get out there and practice uh, your skills so that when you're out at a real game, it'll pay off and you'll be able to capture those moments. Um, this one's my uh, middle son on the left, Stephen, uh, when he played for the Maccabi uh, Dallas team. And the point here is positioning on the field. When you're going to shoot the, the batter at the plate, it, you want to face him so that uh, the shot of him standing still waiting for the pitch to come, you're seeing his face and body. And same with a lefty, you want to be down the third base dugout so that you catch his face and the and the emotion of the swing as it goes through. Um, let me keep going. And, and then Andy, if there's any time you want to jump in with some of your images, please do so. Um, you know, the I'll probably, I'll probably just do after yours and then I can just kind of go through my what okay. I do technically to set up my camera for the different events and then some photos. Probably okay. the best thing. All right, so for hockey, I like to set up uh, around the offensive goal so you can get shots of the goalie defending 
and then also around that face off circle you get uh, some other shots of people around the net or behind the net. Um, so the shot up in the upper left, I like that shot because it captures, you know, the, the spray of the ice. I don't have those shots too often. I mean, that's not a an easy shot to get. I, I took thousands and thousands and thousands of photos to get, you know, just that moment where the ice is spraying, the puck's near his stick, and, you know, it's an in-focus shot and a decent shot. Um, the other thing, instead of from that face-off circle, if you turn towards the far end of the ice, you get the player skating towards you, which is the image in the lower left when uh, Steven, my son, played on the hockey uh, college team at UT. Um, so the important part about shooting hockey is be in a safe place behind the glass. Um, I was fortunate enough with the team because I took team photos and did the end of year slideshow that uh, I could have access on the bench. And there were times that I did shoot from the bench and it makes it nice because you don't have to deal with a slightly dirty piece of glass in front of you and it takes away some of the, the light, uh, but it's dangerous. And there were a few times I quickly ducked behind the post and, and uh, the coach or other players and said, okay, maybe next time I'll shoot behind the glass. So, uh, you know, be careful and enjoy. Uh, lighting, I'm going to probably leave to Andy to talk about because most of my shots uh, were from 10 to 15 years ago. And the, like I mentioned, the, the ISO settings on the cameras weren't as, as good with the, the sensor quality. So, you know, in a dark dungeon of a gym, it was tough to get good lighting. Um, and, and still control with the uh, shutter speed and things. Yeah, David, David, there's a question that really just came up that relates to lighting. Um, for example, in the, uh, the hockey image, where you have different types of light, tungsten and fluorescent, how do you, uh, how do you manage the white balance setting? So I, I've tried a couple different ways. One is some of the rinks have a consistent lighting where it's, it's fluorescent all above or it's tungsten all above. And you can try and use a gray card and preset it. Uh, but what typically I do is I'm shooting in raw. So a camera will save the settings uh, of what the camera used. And then you're processing in the post-processing, you can easily set the white balance. Uh, and I'll, I know Andy can address some of that as well. So I won't steal his thunder, uh, but, but basically, uh, handle it in post. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, one of the things I do for uh, any sport so that it makes it easier for me to process the images is to, to set the, the white balance to a, a prefixed setting. And so that way, when I have 1500 shots, and I once I clean up the ones I want, I can I can set the white balance on one of them, as long as the, the lights are consistent. And then I can automatically apply them to all the other raw files, as, as David mentions, yeah. makes it a lot easier. Uh, if not, if you use auto white balance, then basically you can get uh, all different types of uh, uh, colors or white balance. So right, and, and the thing I learned in the in the hockey rinks is even with the tungsten lighting, every phase of the light was changing color. So when I had a burst mode, I'd have three different shades of white or pink or whatever. So it is a real pain. So. Uh, Definitely or, experiment. Or banding, right? Yes. You get the weird banding where lights go on and off in some places too, where all of a sudden it's dark one place and light another, you know, on the same shot or second shot. Right. So one of the things that I want to touch on, because I know not everybody out there is a sports photographer with long lenses and, and uh, 2.8 heavy lenses and, and you're using a kit lens or you're using your camera phone. And so you end up with an image that, that is a broader image and you wanna crop into that image. And so the options for cropping are, are the one on the left, the middle and, and the right. And I personally like the one on the left because it leaves room for the ball 
to come into the play. And if he were swinging, you'd have room for the bat to be in front. And so it just makes for a natural crop to me versus the center image where he's just perfectly centered. You know, it it's not my favorite. And then the one where he's at the front of the frame to me is, is, is not a good crop. You won't, you, because what are you trying to do? Show the catcher? Where's the catcher? You know, it's like it, it pushes him to the edge and it just doesn't, doesn't make for a, a meaningful story that you're telling with that image. Um, and, and here, like at a professional baseball game, the one on the left is the shot of Josh Hamilton catching the ball and, you know, you crop in as best you can. Uh, but those are just the things you have to do when you don't have the reach with your zoom lens. And same with tennis, uh, you know, where do you crop and, and make the, the shot effective looking. Um, in, in baseball, uh, you don't always have great access. So this is shot from the stands. But the, the one benefit of using the shallow depth of field is that the fence almost melts away. I'm, you, you can see it, you know, especially uh, across the top, but you know, the, the diamond shapes, you barely make out. It melts away because of that shallow depth of field. Um, and then the focus options we talked about, uh, it's interesting, this shot, I think I got very lucky because I was, there's a, a, a feature called panning where you, you're panning with the action to keep that player in your center focus or under your focus dot and you're panning and shooting as you go along. And so sometimes the, the shutter speed wasn't enough to uh, capture all and freeze all the action of the frame, but because you were panning with the runner, it froze him but the defender coming on is, is uh, showing motion, not just out of focus, but showing some motion in that shot. Um, and then lastly, uh, have fun with your photography and, and create something fun with that. Um, so use an editing program like Photoshop to blend in layers of different images. Um, there's several open source options of photo editors. GIMP is one uh, that have similar Photoshop-like features. And so uh, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and show you that these things do print up nice and big. So have at it, Andy. OK. Let me share my screen. All right. Everybody see my screen? Yes. OK. So uh, when I take uh, sports shots, one of the things I first do on any camera setup, no, no matter if I'm indoor or outdoor, is, is to understand who my subject or sport is. So um, these days, I've been taking pictures of Ultimate Frisbee, which is uh, the season just about ready to start. Um, uh, Volleyball is just finishing up and then basketball. So um, for the high school sports, um, I pretty much have kept my settings up at uh, one thousandth of a second uh, shutter speed, um, uh, as or they call it shutter speed priority on some of your cameras you can set up um, to freeze the motion itself. Uh, and the, the next thing I end up doing is is um, setting my aperture and and like what David says is you're opening as wide as you can uh, to get as uh, uh, the best shallow, uh, shallow depth of field um, to you know, have the surroundings uh, kind of be blurred out um, and if you're indoors uh, basically is to bring as much light as you can into the into the camera itself um, and and then after that is your ISO setting. And with the newer cameras itself, you can really push the the uh, the ISO level or noise level, as you call it, uh, up into the 3200 to 6400, uh, depending on what camera you have. Um, for me, the volleyball pictures, the basketball pictures in Sharon, the gym, um, I have to really push the ISO really up there in order to be able to uh, capture the the action itself as well as um, 
uh, have enough light so that the uh, autofocus mechanism can actually capture the subject. If your if your lighting is too low, then the autofocus mechanism can't distinguish the subject and starts hunting around. Um, in some ways, you can like David has talked about is is uh, using back button focus, where basically you can kind of fix fix. Uh, take a picture or focus in a fixed area and have the subject come through. And as long as you know that the, that area is focused, then you can capture that image. Um, what I typically do on my camera with the histogram is I can actually use that and try to make sure that the uh, when I adjust the ISO or the noise level uh, up is I try to keep the histogram within uh, the range where basically it's not uh, uh, down to the lower curve, which is where the, the blacks are, or too high up where basically you're, they call blown out or the highlights get blown out. Um, in my camera, I can push it pretty low and still be able to, to raise what they call the shadows up to get a pretty decent image. And I'll show you that in some of my examples. Um, and one of the key things for me is that uh, in order for me to process uh, the photos, because I can take up to 1,500 shots in a sporting event, is after cleaning them up, uh, how do I, you know, change the white balance and do a lot of the cleanup work before I actually start cropping, which is very important, at least for me in sports, because you're 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 taking the shot wide enough that basically is that you can kind of adjust it to get around the subject of other players and so on and so forth. Um, so. In the in, uh, indoor shots, I use a gray card, or uh, if I forget it, sometimes I actually find a, a white object somewhere to kind of capture as close as I can to, you know, the, a good white balance. Else, I basically set it to, um, I typically set it to the outdoor setting <laughs> for uh, uh, sunlight. Um, I know that the shots, when I look at them uh, in, the, in the camera itself, look pretty bad, but I know I shoot raw, so I can adjust those accordingly. Um, and then for the outdoor ones, uh, basically I set it uh, to the you know the sunlight uh, setting itself, so it's constant, and then I can adjust the white balance when needed. Or um, in some cameras, using the auto white balance, at least from an outdoor perspective, it's sunny out, it will do a pretty good job. Oh, oh, let's go back here. So related to capture emotions um, is or they can motives. Uh, moments itself. So um, here's an example of a photo where uh, it was a lot wider picture than I cropped it in to make it sort of a wide one that kind of shows uh, that, you know, after um, a score, they went back to the other and ultimate itself and uh, two of the other players were goofing around and, and weren't too serious and you know, capturing the moment. Uh, uh, here's another example that I caught just off field play where you have uh, you know, on the left side, people looking at me, the camera want the picture, one focusing on the game and, and the other one focusing on a phone. Um, these are moments that the high school uh, kids really like to see. Um, and of course, a lot of these photos are gonna be related to my daughters and son. I don't think I'm a son in here though, but uh, so capturing the moment or action itself, these were uh, shot, um, large i mean there's a wide area itself and then basically i used crop to crop in the action itself and it's real fun in the rain <laughs> so it's uh, then here's another pr perspective i you know playing around with the camera you know action behind and trying to capture different uh, moments uh perspectives and you can see with using the depth of field you can get the blurriness yeah, advertisement for Camper Ma. <laughs> so, and uh, some volleyball shots. Yeah, this is this is the Sharon Gym, so you can see the lighting is really low. So I had to push it up to 6400, um, and the 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 uh, stop the action. And that's all I have. <laughs> so if you have any questions. Uh, let's 
let's uh, shift gears to um, you know to more of a, a question and answer. But I, I want to thank both of you guys because there's a lot of very valuable information for sports photography. I I was making uh, quite a bit of uh, notes there, but uh, I want to thank everybody for participating in this uh, first meeting, and uh, look forward and keep uh, keep a watch out for our next webinar in May, date to be determined. But in the meantime, you know, we have uh, an email address, very simple, simple, photography at fjmc.org. And we would really like to hear from you. Um, what kind of topics would you like? Uh, would you like uh, more discussions like this where we have images that we can share and discuss amongst ourselves? Would you like professional speakers to come in? Um, and whenever we do post the date and the topic, please let your friends and, and family know about uh, them. And if you're interested in being a presenter, you don't need to, to uh, have a half hour or a longer talk. You can give very short talks and we will, um, we will weave them together into one specific uh, uh, theme webinar. So um, before we open it up to uh, Q and A, and and then you will be able to unmute yourselves uh, and just ask directly. I, just a word from our sponsors. That uh, reminder: FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around the world, and we work hard to uh, provide value to our members in the Jewish community. And to date, FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars since the pandemic began. And we also want to thank those who have given uh, monetary donations. So with that, if you, if you have a comment or a question, um, uh, please unmute, your, unmute yourself and let us hear it and we'll try to address it. And by the way, I saw Bob Gordon posted a question about does the higher ISO produce grainy images? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, sensors, camera sensors uh, can, can capture the image, but it, it just becomes kind of muddy or grainy, kind of like uh, shooting with old film and, and you had just big dots. It's almost like looking at a magazine photo with the magnifying glass and you see just the dots and pixelization uh, that's kind of what you end up with but it's it's always a trade-off you know the preference would be the lower iso uh clearly but when you have lighting issues you just have to deal with what you can um and, yeah, I was and gonna... I, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Andy. No, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I was uh, going through some photos where my my photos looked really grainy. At least from my perspective, they look grainy. But my kids basically came up and says, "It doesn't matter. You captured a moment. My parents, you know, my friends' parents love it. My, you know, my friends love it. So keep on shooting." So even though you might be a perfectionist, uh, capturing a moment for the parents and the kids to see that they might have never even been able to see. Um, it is one of the things that I think puts a lot of joy, the joy that I like, you know, presenting to the kids or showing, uh, producing, so. Right, absolutely. Uh, by the way, uh, David had mentioned our email address to send us photos or comments. Please, please do so. One of the things I'd like to see kind of a show of hands, how many people uh, on are shooting with a, uh, digital SLR, raise your hand or wave or something. So pretty good number. Okay. And, and how many are shooting with a mirrorless camera? A few mirrorless. Okay. And then how about those that are shooting with film still? Anybody? We got one, Dave Kalmeyer. All right. And then how about those that only shoot with their smartphone? got a few guys smartphone guys so one of the things i would suggest for the smartphone users is um i was at a at my our boys are now on the same hockey team as an adult and we went out and were watching and i didn't take my good camera but i took my smartphone because the best camera you have is quote the one you have with you and I went up to the glass and instead of trying to take photos and worrying about, you know, burst mode and shutter speed, 
I, I took video. And when you're for video, that size uh, lens, you know, the, the focal length of the lens by it not being too zoomed in makes it easier to follow the action. It's more of a natural uh, framing of the picture. And so I videotaped them. And then afterwards you come home and you can actually take an image or two out of the video and save it and do a, a small print with it or share it on social media. So my suggestion for, for those shooting, trying to shoot sports with the smartphone is uh, use the video. Don't, don't zoom in unless it's a true optical uh, zoom because all you do is cut, a, cut into the, uh, the quality of the image. You can always zoom in later. But, but take it with video and, and, and then look at it and steal some frames out of the video. I, I do wanna show an image that uh, Bob Watts had sent us of, of uh, his daughter's game. Let me find the image and share. Hopefully that will show up now. Bob, are you unmuted? You can talk about your your daughter's ultimate frisbee game. Okay. Well, this was a whole tournament that I was invited to go with my daughter's uh, a couple of teams from William and Mary, a couple of ultimate frisbee teams, to go to a uh, uh, East Coast um, tournament in uh, North Myrtle Beach because they needed an adult as chaperone for the house they were renting. I got invited. That was the reason I got invited. <laughs> but, uh, but then I took my cameras and shot, shot a lot of the game. Uh, this was just one of, you know, like a couple hundred shots I had. I just wanted to show, um, you know, capturing some action here. I have others where I managed to like um, Andy, did catch the catch the frisbee in midair and uh, following a lot of the same techniques as you said because my camera I use a Canon uh, T6i and uh, the autofocus is not quite as fast as maybe on a full frame and so I'd use a longer um, I, I I'd use a uh, narrower uh, aperture just because of the act all the action going on that's kind of why i asked that question but i think you gave some good tips about how to how to deal with that because now i have a newer mirrorless where i can freeze the focus uh, get more focus points and right uh, what, the focus. one other tip i want to share with everybody and be sure it comes across and that is rent a lens there's some national companies for renting lenses. Uh, my brother, Brian, has rented some lenses. Brian, unmute yourself for putting in chat the name of that lens rental place. Uh, in Dallas, uh, where I'm at, I'm fortunate that there's a local camera store that actually rents some pro quality lenses. Uh, and they give you a, a weekend rate special where you, you rent it on a Friday and bring it back by Monday morning and it's a one day rental fee. So it, it's worked out great for me, but it's a great way to put a very expensive lens on your SLR and, and have what the appropriate focal length lens that you want for some special event. Like my brother uh, with the uh, uh, Blue Angels uh, that were in town during their national tour, and he went out and rented, I think of, 400 millimeter on a crop sensor and you know you rent it for a day or, or a week or whatever the thing is get a great use out of it send it back you don't have to buy a multi-thousand dollar lens just just rent it for the day or week and and go out and have some fun david, can, I, can i david and andy uh, can i just another technical point about lighting um do you does flash photography have any role to play in sports photography? Go ahead. No, Andy. no. <laughs> you'll get you'll get screamed at by by people if you do do that. But you you shouldn't use that. That, that distracts the players itself, and it doesn't really help much. 
in a very, especially in a very large venue. So, right. It, I agree with Andy. The, I mean, you don't want to blind the player right as they're about to to try and do a spike on the volleyball or whatever. So yeah, I would avoid the the flash. Uh, although it is a great technique for freezing the action in in other kinds of of venues. Uh, and and one of the things I'd also like to see a show of hands. How how many like to do uh, uh, people photography? How many like to do people photography? Okay, hands down. How many like to do landscape photography? <laughs> All right. So a, a good good wide variety of uh, fellow photographers and enthusiasts. So one other one. How about macro any macro shooters? Yeah, I mean, you know, talking about macro photography, that is where the cell phone is a tremendous asset. Um, we went down to the Dallas Arboretum, and I had both cameras with me, my my DSLR and my my camera phone. I can't tell you the great shots I got by taking the camera phone and literally putting it right up to the the flower and the pistol and and all the parts of the flower, and and getting a great macro shot and it's good quality sensors these days and and the lenses are good in in these camera phones so you know used appropriately you can do some great stuff with it. You know, in, in terms of interest in uh, what people are doing, there were uh, in the uh, chat. Um, I received some uh, comments about uh, uh, people attending this uh, session interested in uh, learning about photo editing. So that's a, a topic that can be uh, used. And also image sharing, where uh, uh, people, uh, participants can offer to share some images for more general uh, bantering around. Uh, but it's just an idea that everyone should uh, uh, let us know what your thoughts and your desires are. We'll try to incorporate them in uh, future programs because we're really at the beginning stages of formulating this group and we want to make it as meaningful as possible for everybody. So please keep in touch with us and let us know what you want. We'll do. Uh, one of the comments from uh, Alan Konigsberg, who's a, a member of Beth Torah here in Dallas, uh, he had asked me to mention the importance of the background when you're shooting your your photos and so when you're setting up for shooting the action or any photo in general be aware of what's going to be in the background of that image and you know try not to have uh telephone poles that are sticking up behind the player's head um so just be aware of what's in that background when you're composing your shot and deciding where to stand on the field, because those those can be distracting. Um, perhaps, somebody, had, perhaps we should, um, you know, bring this to a close so we stay close. We stay uh, adherent to our nine o'clock uh, uh, time and and really hope that everyone will communicate with us through the, uh, that email as we have some post-meeting conversations about what kind of uh, programs to put on. Um, unless there's some burning question that you know, we need to have uh, uh, opposed at this point. Well, I think uh, it's interesting. Uh, Phil Waxford was asking if he could show a picture. And uh, since we haven't set up to do that, I don't know if that's gonna, if that can be done simply, it'd be interesting to, let them try and uh, see if, uh, if that's an effective thing that we can be doing in the future, which is to just have people uh, put up pictures casually or if we have- Richard, if you, to, give me, uh, if you give me permission, I can, I can share my screen. I can pull, I can, I'm all set. All right, let me see. If, let me just see if that's- And, and I, I will say that uh, on a, I think on an ongoing basis, what we'd like to do is, is we'll communicate with you guys about ways of either emailing us the photo or possibly posting photos on a Google photo album. And then during the meeting, 
one of the hosts will share our screen and go through those images and we can have open discussion about those images. Um, so, oh, look at that. So there's right, some so post that worked out perfectly. Great, beautiful. That's a nice shot. So you did some post processing yes. to, uh, to, to colorize and decolorize, very nice. Yeah, to decolorize the rest and highlight the, uh, I was up at the, up looking down at the uh, Celtics game, wasn't, didn't have much of a view. And of course the light being what it is, uh, but was able to. I've, so what software did you use to decolor? Uh, I use Photoshop. So I, I, I highlight and then I pull and pull everything, you know. Highlighted the area that I wanted to remain color colorized and pulled made everything else black and white. Did by the uh, way, uh, Philip expert just to touch on the photo editing, one way to do that, did you use layers and a mask when did when you did that, or did you just do a, a one time highlight of the area and then just bring it down and adjust? Uh, and you may not remember. I don't know necessarily how to do masks. That's okay. So, I, so, so we'll just leave it at. We'll have a future conversation about post processing and editing, because there's some tremendous features that you can use with the masks and layers that will easily allow you to to really highlight and and focus on uh, bringing the art to your image. But that's a that's a great shot. Whether you used however you did it, it's a great shot. So thank you for sharing. And and everybody, uh, I apologize for being from Texas and talking so slow with all you, with all you uh, New Englanders up there. But uh, we, on behalf of myself and Andy and and David, thank you for your time this evening. And and please look for our email looking for further feedback and suggestions on future programs. Great job, guys. Great, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Um, Thank you all. Not soon. Keep barbecuing, David. Uh, yes, soon. that's right. Say, put on your dates, October 24th, uh, 2021, the Dallas Kosher, the sixth or seventh annual Dallas Kosher Barbecue Championship in Dallas. Very good. Y'all come. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Very much. Good night. Excellent. Thank you. Good night. Good night, night all.